Romance of the Three Kingdoms is one of the greatest literature in the world. Based on real history, it has epic battles, drama, tactics, strategies, and larger-than-life characters. Its musing on the moral grey zone of political legitimacy provides a priceless window to a unique East Asian narrative. It is definitely a masterpiece everyone should read. But the problem is, it is just too long. With 120 chapters and 95 episode adaptations, not many people could stay engaged long enough to finish the whole story. So in this series, I will summarize all 120 chapters in 7 short episodes. Just to let you know, this is all based on the novel, so it will not match the real history 100%. But don't worry history fans, I will cover the discrepancies between the novel and the real history in a future video. This tale starts at the twilight of the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty was established in 202 before Common Era by Liu Bang, a peasant-born small-town sheriff who lied, cheated, and scammed his way to the highest throne in the land. Luckily for the people, this scamp was a pretty chill dude. He reduced taxes, treated the people well, and the dynasty actually became the first golden age of China. After surviving a usurpation in the first century, the dynasty was revived. But eventually, near the end of the second century, the empire faced another great crisis. Plagued by palace intrigue and the treacherous corruption of the Ten Eunuchs, the mismanaged empire was crumbling, and rebellions boiled all across the land. In the year 184, one of the rebel groups proclaimed that the Blue Heaven is dying and the Yellow Heaven arises. They were the Yellow Turban Rebels, led by the Taoist cult leader Zhang Zhao and his brothers Zhang Liang and Zhang Bao. As they rampaged across the land, demolishing the imperial army, the local governors had no choice but to seek volunteer army against these ferocious rebels. Among those who were willing was Liu Bei from Zhuo County. Liu Bei was a descendant of the imperial family, a very, very distant cousin of the emperor. Yet, his family was poor, and he made his living by selling straw sandals with his mother. He wanted to help end the chaos, but ultimately, he knew that he couldn't do anything by himself. So he let out a sigh. <sighs> what are you sighing about? A real man will serve the emperor at a time of need. That loud voice came from Zhang Fei, a hot-tempered local butcher. Finding that they had a common cause, the two continued their conversation in a tavern, where they met another like-minded individual, Guan Yu. So the three of them raised a small army and swore an oath of brotherhood in a peach garden. They swore to defend the people and protect each other. Even though they are not born in the same year, same month of the same day, they will die together on the same year, month, and day. Thus, the brothers joined the army. They had modest success and defended nearby cities from the rebels' rampage. Meanwhile, on the countryside, another contingent of the rebel force was ambushed and routed by the cunning and talented General Cao Cao. Cao Cao was the foster grandson of a eunuch, and a fortune teller once told him that, in times of peace, he will be a good minister. But in times of chaos, he will be a cunning hero. Lots of important figures made their name in the suppression of this rebellion. Dong Zhuo also made his appearance here, as he was saved by Liu Bei from Zhang Zhao's assault. But the rude commander ignored Liu Bei because he was not a high-ranking officer. Eventually, Zhang Zhao and his brothers were killed by the imperial army, and what was left of them were cleaned up by Sun Jian, a powerful general nicknamed the Tiger of Jiang Dong. His family claimed to be the descendants of Sun Zi, the author of Sun Zi's Art of War. Even though the Yellow Turbans were defeated, peace did not return, because the source of all this chaos were still living large in the Imperial Palace, the Ten Eunuchs. The corruption was deeply entrenched. Even Liu Bei became its victim. After his service, he was given a small magisterial post but he was unable to pay the bribe money to the imperial inspector who tried to blackmail him. Witnessing this injustice, 
Zhang Fei flew into rage and tied the inspector to a post and gave him a trashing. He wanted to kill the corrupt official, but the benevolent Liu Bei stopped him and spared the man's life. Obviously, that wasn't enough to get themselves out of trouble. So to atone for their crime, they served the imperial army again to suppress another rebellion. We must get rid of the eunuch with a small strike force now, Cao Cao said. Meanwhile in the palace, an anti-eunuch clique had formed, led by He Jing, the empress's brother. Its other members included Cao Cao and Yuan Sao, a general from a prestigious family and also Cao Cao's old friend. They had managed to enthrone He Jing's nephew as the new emperor, but they were locked in a debate deciding on what to do next. He Jing, who got his position due to his connection rather than his ability, foolishly went against all good advice and decided to invite Dong Zhuo and his massive army to the palace as backup against the eunuchs. Obviously, the arrival of such large army alerted the eunuchs, and the palace spiraled into chaos. He Jing, Cao Cao, and Yuan Sao quickly rushed to the emperor's side. As if trying to outdo his foolishness, the bumbling commander He Jing walked into an obvious trap and he was killed. Enraged by this, the other two rushed into the inner chambers and slaughtered the eunuchs. But alas, they were too late. A few eunuchs managed to escape and took the emperor and his brother with them as hostage. In the midst of the chaos, the eunuchs were killed and the boys were lost in the wilderness. Not knowing who was on their side, they hid from everyone. Until they were eventually discovered by Dong Zhuo. Liu Xie, the emperor's younger brother, stepped forward and told Dong Zhuo to pay his proper respect to the emperor. Impressed by the gutsy little prince, Dong Zhuo thought that perhaps this eight-year-old boy would make a better emperor. And puppet. His plan was opposed by another minister, Ding Yuan, and they took to the battlefield. Dong Zhuo, who was a veteran commander, was surprisingly forced to retreat all because of this one warrior on his enemy's side, the peerless Lü Bu. Ding Yuan's greatest asset, however, turned out to be his greatest liability, as he was betrayed and murdered in the night by his godson Lü Bu, all just for some treasures and a horse. To be fair, it was a really good horse, the greatest horse among all horses, the Red Hare. Now with Lü Bu on his side, Dong Zhuo was virtually unstoppable, even Yuan Sao, who defiantly raised his sword against him in protest, was unable to do anything before he took refuge in the provinces. After replacing the emperor with his puppet, Dong Zhuo killed the former emperor and his mother and ruled as tyrant. Urged by Yuan Sao, who took refuge in the provinces, a loyal minister organized resistance against Dong Zhuo, Wang Yun. They had the will, but unfortunately, not the way. Dong Zhuo was under Lü Bu's constant protection. There is just no way they could get him, they lamented. Cao Cao scoffed at them from the side, before volunteering to assassinate Dong Zhuo himself. Again, Cao Cao became part of another conspiracy. He just loved his cloak and daggers. But to do so, he needed a precious sword called the Seven Star Sword. On the next day, he proceeded with his plan. But before he could make his move, Dong Zhuo saw his reflection in the mirror. What are you up to, Cao Cao? Oh, 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 well, I got a gift for you. <laughs> Cao Cao lied, and he presented the sword to Dong Zhuo to distract him before he ran the heck away from the palace. It took them a while before they realized that he was probably trying to assassinate Dong Zhuo and gave chase. What many people don't realize is that Cao Cao runs away a lot in this story. So to keep track of how many times he ran, I have set up a special counter here. On his escape, Cao Cao was captured by a local magistrate, Chen Gong, who sympathized with his cause. Cao Cao was then released and the two set off to Cao Cao's homeland to raise an army to overthrow the tyrant Dong Zhuo. Along the way, they encountered Cao Cao's family friend who gave them refuge. But since Cao Cao was a fugitive with a large bounty on his head, he was paranoid. He misheard a conversation and thought that they were planning to kill him. So Cao Cao preemptively massacred the family in self-defense, only to later discover that they were actually planning to slaughter a pig in his honor. But what was done was done. Cao Cao cold-bloodedly killed the family friend too to silence him. 
disgusted by this, Chen Gong left Cao Cao. And this is where Cao Cao said his famous line, I would rather betray the world than let it betray me. Once he made it home, Cao Cao gathered his men and army and forged a letter from the emperor to induce the other lords to rise up against the tyrant Dong Zhuo. Thus, many lords and nobles gathered and formed an anti-Dong Zhuo coalition. Yuan Shao, who came from a prestigious family, was then chosen to be its leader. Meanwhile, Liu Bei, who was just serving as a small town magistrate, was roped into the coalition by his friend Gong Sun Zhan. With this grand coalition descending upon Dong Zhuo, it seemed as if their victory was assured. But the moment they reached Sisui Pass, Sun Jian's army met strong resistance. And since the quartermaster Yuan Su refused to send any supplies, his army was defeated and he barely escaped. Dong Zhuo's general Hua Xiong's early victory delivered a blow to the coalition's morale, and this incident revealed the first crack in their veneer of solidarity. Hua Xiong, the big hulking man, challenged the coalition's warrior to a duel, and he mercilessly cut down two of their champions one after another. Just as everyone was paralyzed by fear, Guan Yu, who was a literal nobody at the time, stepped up to volunteer for a duel. If I fail, you can take my head, he said. Impressed by his bravado, Cao Cao offered him a warm wine. So in perhaps what was the earliest hold my beer moment, Guan Yu rode away to duel his enemy. War drums rolled, the ground thundered, and after a few moments, the sound of hoofbeats approached the coalition camp. Guan Yu returned victorious before his wine got cold. With Hua Xiong's defeat, Dong Zhuo sent his main force to Ku Lao Gate, led by Lü Bu. Hua Xiong was just the mid-boss, and he was the real deal. The coalition generals who were foolish enough to ride up against him were crushed like insects. Gong Sun Zhan, who tried to escape, was saved from certain death by the fiery Zhang Fei. Zhang Fei was as powerful as his brother Guan Yu, but even he couldn't get the upper hand. Then Guan Yu joined the fray, and so did Liu Bei, who tried to be useful. Even with the combined power of the three brothers, they couldn't defeat Liu Bu. But eventually, Liu Bu got exhausted, and he turned to retreat. This seeming victory boosted the coalition's morale, and they made their push towards the gate. They couldn't break through that day, but breaching it is only a matter of time. In his desperation, Dong Zhuo decided to move the capital to Chang'an. But before he did, he robbed the population, looted the imperial graves before burning the capital, Luoyang. When the coalition finally broke through, they were accosted by a haunting scene of desolation. Cao Cao tried to pursue Dong Zhuo, only to fall into an ambush. Outnumbered, Cao Cao barely escaped with his head intact. Meanwhile, back in Luoyang, Sun Jian discovered an unimaginably precious treasure inside an abandoned well, the heirloom seal of the realm. This is the symbol of the mandate of heaven. Having this would strengthen someone's claim to be the emperor of China. But little did he know that this discovery was more of a curse than a blessing. Rumors of the discovery soon got out, and the coalition, which was already strained, tear itself apart, and everything degenerated into warlordism. Sun Jian broke off and headed home to Changsha. Suspecting that he had the seal, Yuan Shao sent a letter to Governor Liu Biao to intercept him. Meanwhile, Yuan Shao himself occupied a coalition member's territory through deception. This angered Gong Sun Zhan, who challenged Yuan Shao. Even though he had a smaller force, Gong Sun was given support by Liu Bei, his brothers, and Zhao Yun, who made his first appearance in the novel here. Capitalizing on this rift, Dong Zhuo bought over the two to his side. And this turn of events horrified Liu Bei and Zhao Yun. Down south, the conflict between Liu Biao and Sun Jian intensified. The latter was able to defeat Liu Biao's general, but due to his carelessness, Sun Jian was lured into an ambush and crushed by boulders. His 17-year-old son, Sun Ce, then took over as the head of the family. Even though he was young, he was wise enough to call for a truce and bide his time. So with all the coalition members on each other's throat, it looked like Dong Zhuo's position was finally safe. But not if Wang Yun had anything to say about it. He had another plot, and Diao Chan, 
the smart and beautiful singer girl had volunteered herself to be part of it. To drive a wedge between Dong Zhuo and Lü Bu, he promised the girl to Lü Bu first before giving her away to Dong Zhuo. Enamored by her beauty, Lü Bu was obviously furious at this broken promise. But Wang Yun skillfully shifted the blame to Dong Zhuo, claiming that he was the one who forcefully took her away. With Jiao Chan in on the act, constantly begging him to take her away, the proud Lü Bu was completely suckered into their plot. So Lü Bu joined Wang Yun's coup, and he took the personal pleasure in ending his godfather's life. There is a Chinese idiom, Ying Xiong Nan Guo Mei Ren Guan. Even heroes have a weakness for the charms of a beautiful woman. It is very ironic, isn't it, that even all the heroes under the heaven couldn't do a single woman's job. All right, the title for the next episode is Lü Bu Must Die. Be sure to subscribe and like the video so that you don't miss it. If you like what we are doing here, then you can support us on Patreon. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.